Hi, this is Amanda and it's my day two of my uh, diary to wellness um, on my journey to expose that autoimmune deficiency um, has had some serious consequences, not just to me, but to millions of people out there. And I am on a journey of three months to go from chronic uh, symptoms to complete health. And um, I know that there's a lot of people out there who are already starting to follow me on this. So interestingly, I, I read some uh, in, uh, information last night which really related to me. And it says that whenever we're exposed to any environmental triggers, such as glutens, peanuts, mold, etc., our immune system is activated to protect us. Uh, this is happening 24-7 and it's designed to work in the background so we don't actually notice it. But this is referred to as normal immunity. Uh, you feel nothing and if the level of insult or the amount of exposure increases you might then experience mild irritations such as runny nose sore muscles and brain fog well i've had runny nose i've had um, uh, scans that have detected fluid in my nasal cavity years and years and years ago and what did they treat it with antibiotics and what happened it came back and what did they do about it nothing so if the level of exposure continues to increase, the immune system has to respond more aggressively, which begins the inflammation cascade. Excess inflammation beyond the normal range will cause cellular damage. Continued cellular damage will cause tissue damage. Continued tissue damage will cause organ inflammation. Continued organ inflammation will increase the intensity of symptoms and you develop elevated antibodies to that organ. Continued elevated antibodies to an organ leads to organ damage. Now you have symptoms that can be identified as an autoimmune disease. But despite the fact that I had a condition called hydronephrosis that had developed after an elevated amount of um, uh, symptoms that had developed over years and years and years, the doctors told me, well, perhaps when we've got rid of your kidney, which has now died, it had grown and swollen to the size of a small football. They assumed that once the kidney was removed, I would lose all the other symptoms, but they were wrong because the symptoms have just got worse. However, I'm now less one kidney. So I was listening this morning to something interesting on the news, which was to do with mental health. And it triggered something because I was, when I was at the doctor's two days ago, there was a very, very um, troubled lady that had had caused quite a lot of commotion in the, in the reception area. I'd gone back out to get some blood tests, so I was queuing and waiting. And this poor woman was absolutely at breaking point. She was shouting and screaming and saying that she would not leave until she was helped. She'd had enough. She was breaking. The way the doctors de dealt with it was kind of, it was difficult to judge. One doctor came out and asked her very calmly if she would please be quiet because there's other patients. But she said clearly to him, if you keep telling me that, I'm going to get louder. And he kept on saying to her, please, can you just calm down? He didn't actually at any stage say to her, what is happening for you? What can I do for you? How can I help? And that was so sad because that escalated until eventually the police were called for an hour and a half. And we were all there because we couldn't actually leave the doctor's surgery because it all spilled out to, to the outside. She was crying out for help and nobody was addressing this. All they were trying to do was suppress her anxiety so as not to disturb the, the rest of the patients at the practice. Now this is this is kind of what has been happening for many of us when we go to the doctor. We, we are suppressed with um, medication or placated with excuses or brushed aside because nothing can be done. Now I've been looking into this research and I have done an experiment. I did a 10 week fast where I eliminated certain foods from my, my diet, which were anything to do with carbohydrates, including gluten, anything to do with dairy and anything to do with sugar. And the miraculous thing was, is that when I did this in January of last year to March, I went from full blown symptoms to no symptoms whatsoever in 10 weeks. I didn't drink alcohol, I didn't have any poisons. I just had a very pure diet of 
um, lots of vegetables, uh, meats and, and uh, fruits and water, plenty of water, nothing to do with, with any of the, the poisons that had been affecting my body. Not only that, my environmental factors changed. Now, at one point there was, I couldn't even go into, I was finding it, um, I was, was no longer tolerant, tolerating my own environment in my home. Every time I was exposed to lights, electricity, if I went into a supermarket, I would faint. And there was two very serious situations um, that I had on a plane the uh, six months prior to that. And that was the, the crisis point where I collapsed on a, on a plane. And that was when we got to a certain level, at a certain height, and everybody got their mobile phones out. And as soon as that pressure of all those, uh, the, all the uh, frequencies from those phones was switched on, my head went into overload. And it was an incredibly frightening experience, so much so that they were going to divert the plane. Fortunately, I knew what was going on. I said, I have something that's going on that affects my, my brain. Now, this is not just something that is a few symptoms that causes us some wellness. This is something I, I live with and I manage this. I run, I run a business. I run a big household. We have seven children between us. My partner and I, we have two grandchildren. We have a big family, a very, very uh, busy life. We, we're out most nights of the week to, 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 the, to events. And I run a large network of people that I support and help. But still, I have to deal with these, these ongoing symptoms that flare up for at any time and for apparently what I seem to think in the past was no reason, but there actually is. It's my immune system reacting to my environment or whatever I ingest. So saying that, I've looked back and I've actually recognized that the trigger for me was when I was 19, I went to live with my mother. And I, was a, I came from an upbringing where I was um, starved. I, um, I lived with my father. Um, Food was very scarce for me, so I would eat whatever I could. I was a skinny kid. As I became a young teenager and I left home, oh my gosh, it was heaven. I could eat whatever I wanted. And yes, you know, having swam uh, uh, competitively all my childhood and then stopping all exercise and starting to eat foods that I'd never really experienced before, I was in my element. I was absolutely for the first time in my life, enjoying everything I could possibly get my hands on. But it came at a price because when I went to live with my mother, her old fashioned attitude towards how we have relationship was, oh, you're a little bit overweight, my darling. You better lose some weight, otherwise you'll never get yourself a nice boyfriend. And that devastated me. Up to that point, I had already suppressed all those feelings of unworthiness from my childhood. And so that just made me look at my body and say, okay, so no one's going to accept me for who I am. And I immediately spiraled into um, food uh, difficulties. I started going into um, controlling the way I ate. So I watched and observed my mother who came home from work, um, had a long busy day. She ate very little during the day. In fact, no breakfast, no lunch. It was usually liquid. And then when she came home, she prepared a very small meal for us all to eat. But while she was in the kitchen, she secretly ate a lot of cheese. So I learned that eating in secret was the only way to, 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 you know, to be skinny like my mother. So I became a binge eater. So what I would do is I would absolutely cram myself full of carbohydrates and it was all wheat based. I, would, I had a, a craving for breads, pastries, cakes, anything that was thick, starchy, stodgy carbohydrates and sweets. So those were my two things. I had drawers full of chocolates that I would hide as, as my, my you know, days when I had to eat. And then I would starve myself for three days. So that was my, my food, um, food issue. I, you know, I wasn't... I couldn't do bulimia, I couldn't do anorexia, and that was the way I coped. And I had that food issue from the age of 19 until I was 32. So that is a huge chunk of my life 
where my body was going through this crisis. Every three days, I would st stuff myself until I felt sick. And then I would go through three days of torturing myself and not eating and starving myself to that point where I was going to faint and then the, re the cycle would restart again. And what I've seen by the evidence is that our problem with our immune system is not to do with what's going on now. When the symptoms are here, it's already developed for over years and years and years. Like me, when there's organ failure, it has been going on for probably decades. And this is the, the scary thing about it. They've done a lot of tests. They've, they've actually showed that this can actually affect people with mental health, with um, uh, uh, conditions like ADHD. And so therefore, when I look back, I realize that I triggered that uh, intolerance. My body obviously knew that it was not good for me. What I was doing was not good for me with, with, with regard to uh, gluten and to do with sugars. So with those carbs in particular and sugar. And so in the end, my body decided that it was not going to tolerate me doing that to myself. So every time I ate something that was gluten-based, or sugar-based, I would have this horrendous feeling of depression. And, it, and I mean it in a very tangible sense. So even though I love to eat things like that, obviously we all do, my body actually triggers this very serious condition in me, which has taken me to the edge on many occasions. So I recognize that actually my autoimmune system was starting to play out and starting to break down from the age of 19. Now, at the age of, so um, in 2003, and I would have been by then uh, in mid-30s, I would have been 35, 36, I was 36 then, I then developed meningococcal septicemia, and that nobody could work out where that came from. And when that was eventually healed, which took 18 months, I then continued to, to uh, create other conditions that were trying to tell my system that it was not tolerating the environment. Now, for the last five years, I have now got to this point where the pressures in the head, the, the ability, the, 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 the difficulty in walking and carrying myself through my day has, is not something that I have to tolerate anymore. And actually, According to the research, there is a way that I can reverse a lot of this damage. Now, I can't replace my organ, I can't replace my kidney, um, but I have one good kidney, and I can last a very good life on one kidney. So, if you can just look back at your life to look at any of these um, triggers, perhaps. I, I worked with a, um, a consultant recently on a pilot study and he very interestingly mirrored a lot of the research that he's been doing with other doctors that I've, I've worked with in this field who have also recognized that there is something going on that's far deeper that is not being recognized by the medical profession. Now, unbelievably, last night I read something. Let's, let's have a look where I read that. It was incredible, that's right. Apparently, science takes 17 years to actually catch up. Now, in what I read, it's saying that actually, because science discovers that the autoimmune system is, is um, the cause, the root cause of a lot of our, our conditions, it takes 17 years before it finally gets to the GP surgery for them to actually bring that to, to, to our attention to actually honor that. So that is a massive shortfall. That means we have to wait for 17 years before research catches up with us, science catches up so that we can actually well ourselves, or we can try doing it the simpler way, which is rather than self-medicate, rather than keep waiting for diagnosis, do something about, us, about it ourselves. And apparently, more Nobel Prizes have gone out for discovery about the uh, immune system than anything else. So if this is something that is the lead cause to so many different issues, then why aren't we taking this more seriously? So with the, with the consultant that we, I spoke to recently, 
he and other doctors that I've spoken to have recognized that actually the, um, the root cause can also be triggered by trauma. And with trauma, that then creates um, an imbalance in the body. And when the imbalance is there, then we're likely to do things that are not good and not healthy for ourselves. So there is this underlying cause that, that creates this. For me, it was my childhood, my upbringing. And then I compensated with control, control through food. It was my way. I didn't, I didn't drink at the time. I didn't do drugs. So my control, my drug was food. It was sugar and carbs. And that is now why my body says, uh-oh, this is poison. What are you doing to yourself? So, you know, we can go on diets, we can go on good, healthy eating plans, but every single person is individual. And what I'm saying is that we've got to find our own way, what it is that we are intolerant of that helps us because every single one of us has a unique story. And every single one of us has unique symptoms based on that unique story. So that's my video diary for today. Um, just have a think about any triggers, anything that you recognize that was an imbalance in your life, perhaps in your early, you know, in your teens, in your 20s, 30s, even a few years ago, but re recognize that symptoms have already started manifesting and coming to the forefront because the body is finally saying, I've had enough, do something about this. So until next time, Keep well and see you soon.